I'm excited to be speaking with Jonah Berger, a globally recognized thought leader in word of mouth, consultant, professor at the Wharton School of Business, and author of the recent New York Times bestselling book, Contagious and Why Things Catch On, on this episode of Substance. Well, thank you so much, Jonah, for being here today. I appreciate you taking some time out. I know you're visiting from Philadelphia, where you're living now in... Durham, North Carolina. North Carolina. So you're all over the place. (laughs) And just to be able to catch you in between all the things that you have going on is just really exciting for me to be able to sit here and talk about your endeavors. So Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's jump right into it. I want to talk a little bit about your background. And one of the things I know, you because I've read your book now, and I, I know now... Uh, maybe more than you know. No, I'm kidding. I know now that you have this passion for engineering growing up, and that's transitioned into your studies in psychology and psychology yeah. and other things. How did how did all of that come together for you? So growing up, I was very interested in math and science. Uh, hard sciences, traditional things, chemistry, material science. Went to a special high school for people that were interested in math and science. Mm. Um, but when I got to college, I sort of discovered psychology. I'd taken a little bit of psychology before, but I'd never realized how interesting it was. Um, and I became more and more interested in trying to apply those traditionally hard science tools to what we normally think as softer sciences. So uh, social influence. Well, how does that work? Why do we make certain decisions rather than other decisions? How does word of mouth work? Why do things go viral on the web? Uh, And so really trying to apply those hard science tools of statistics, of rigorous experimentation, to understanding these underlying questions of human behavior. So then how did that transition then into, you're now teaching, you mentioned that you just had a huge honor with getting tenure. Yeah, so I've been at the Wharton School now for seven years, um, and we've basically spent the last decade studying the science of word of mouth. So why we talk about some things rather than others, and more recently, why things spread on the web. Mm -hmm. I think these are fascinating questions, but they're really foundational questions about why we do the things that we do. Uh, And so we've been working hard to understand these things, and and the book, Contagious, is sort of the fruits of all these labors. So we've learned a lot of things. I don't think we've learned everything. Mm -hmm. Still a lot more to go. We're doing a dozen or more projects every uh, every week as we're we're speaking. Um, But we've learned some things, and it's nice to put them together in one place to help companies and individuals apply them. Well, you have a unique opportunity to work with young minds with people that are looking at things a different way. And those young minds are being able to see maybe what's coming because they're not looking at things the way that perhaps people with a career after 10, 20 years are looking at things. How has that affected your research? It's been very interesting. I think it's, I teach a course at the Wharton School uh, called Contagious that's based a little bit, the book is one day of the course, it's a a larger course, but it's not taught anywhere else. Mm -hmm. They sort of freed me up to teach an elective about this new and emerging area. Um, And what's so great about it is I think we all see these tools in our daily life. We all see Facebook and Twitter and watch videos on YouTube and interact on these online channels. We don't always understand how they work or why they work or most importantly, are they effective for business? And so a lot of what I do in my course with the students is help them actually play with these tools and see if they're effective. So we do a really simple exercise with Twitter, for example. Everyone has to get on, try to build a following, post a thing a day, use short links to see how many people are clicking. At the end, get a sense of, well, if I was a business, right, and I am gonna be a business one day, either personal, larger business, or my own business, would this be an effective tool or not? Mm-hmm. When would it be an effective tool? Why would it be an effective tool? So rather than really following the hype, we're at the cutting edge of research and really applying these concepts to see how effective they are. Mm-hmm. So then how has that helped you in your social endeavor? You have a Twitter handle. I, yes, so the publisher, uh, the book came out about six months ago. The publisher's like, you gotta get on Twitter. So I did, uh, and I, you so, know. <laughs> so of all people. <laughs> <laughs> on contagious uh, thoughts, why, why six months ago? Yeah, you know, um, uh, only 7% of word of mouth is online. I think if you ask most people how, what percent wow. would they think it is, they'd say 70%, 50%, right. at least 30%. But if you, if you guessed, you'd get it wrong. Um, yes, it's growing. It's going to be 8% next year, whatever it's going to be next. And yes, among the younger demographics, it's higher, but it's not 20% among younger folks. It's still a low percentage. Um, And it's a tool that it can be useful, but takes time and effort, just like any other tool. It takes time to post things, to figure out what the right thing to post is, and to craft that message just so, so people want to retweet it and pass it on. Um, Same thing with Facebook. 
Same thing with LinkedIn. I actually wasn't, uh, I had a LinkedIn profile from 2007, and then they sent me an email about uh, three months ago saying, hey, we have a new influencer program, people are writing articles for the homepage, would you be willing to write these articles? And I said, sure. And I, I turned in my first article, and then I realized I had no picture on there, I had no information, it was an old profile, and so I had to update it. Um, I think these things can be helpful, but just like any tool, you need to use it effectively. Mm -hmm. um, just because you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, doesn't mean people are sharing your content, mm -hmm. doesn't mean they're engaging with you, and doesn't mean it's leading to the metrics that you care about. And so I think as any business, what's important to say is, well, what am I putting into this and what am I getting out? Mm -hmm. How much time am I putting into this and where could that time be used otherwise? And what am I getting out of it? Am I enjoying it? Well, maybe that's fine. If that's all it is, that's the goal, that's great. If not, what am I getting? Am I building my followers? Okay, but what does that mean? Can I use those followers later for something else or am I just watching a number go higher? It feels great, right? Mm -hmm. It's like getting mail at camp. Everyone loves to get mail at camp. You feel special. Someone's following you, you feel special. That feels good. Um, but beyond that little shot of dopamine that's rewarding, is that actually helping my business? Mm -hmm. um, or are people really engaging my content and sharing my content, which is probably more likely to have positive downstream mm -hmm. effects. How does that have to have the research that you did behind all of your social interactions with your students, the, yeah. the things that you did to build up towards this book, how did that build towards your STEP program? So, uh, you know, we spent a long time studying these issues. Uh, we've done things like look at six months of New York Times articles, every piece of content written by the newspaper. Some make the most emailed list, a bunch don't. Why? Well, some is about as where they're featured or who wrote them or you know what section it's in, but what about the emotion that the content evokes? What about the useful information that's contained in that content? We've looked at tens of thousands of brands, both online and off. We've gotten some amazing data about word of mouth of those brands. And we can say things not only like, well, brand X gets more word of mouth than brand Y. That's fine, but it's not really useful. Mm -hmm. What's more important to know is, well, why does one brand get more word of mouth than another? So if I'm either brand or a totally different brand, I can use those insights to get my content to be more contagious. Mm -hmm. um, and so again and again, we saw that it wasn't random and it wasn't luck. Uh, you know, I can't guarantee 10 billion views for the next piece of content you put up there. Um, but there are a number of key scientific principles that drive people to talk and share. It's not chance. And so I wrote the book based on those principles, saying there are six key drivers of what people pass on. Give me the six. Uh, so it's a STEPS framework, uh, S-T-E-P-P-S. Uh, you'll notice there are two P's. That's because I'm not a very clever guy. If I was, I could come up with a better acronym. Uh, but it's social currency, triggers, emotion, public, practical value, and stories. And each of those is a research-driven concept that we found works again and again. But the book illustrates it through stories and other methods to help people not only see the science, mm -hmm. but how to make that science work for them. And you talk about it as though it's not a recipe. You pick and pull what you need. Yeah. So there's no silver bullet if it's not a recipe. How do you turn that into a silver bullet? How do yeah. you become contagious within the STEP program? So I would say um, that following the steps, great analogy, I think about baseball, right? Um, so following the steps will raise your batting average. I think for most companies and organizations and individuals, uh, you would love 10 million views, that would be fine, but really what you would like is if one, every customer you have, every person that interacts with you tell just one more person about your business, you'd be very happy, right? You'd be great, you'd be golden. And so that's what the goal of the steps are. Now you're right, there's no one step that's much more important than the others, and if you just do this, that's it. Um, but life isn't like that. There are six, uh, but you don't need to apply every single one with every marketing effort you do. So uh, take the book, for example. We made the cover orange because we realized that's public, more observable, easier, more likely that other people are gonna imitate that, that thing. If they see people reading it, they'll wonder what it is, they'll go get it for themselves. We didn't build all the concepts into the cover of the book, we built one. But we also did other marketing around different concepts as well. So, uh, you know, social currency, people like to be smart in the know. Well, we released the book early to a certain set of people to increase buzz among the right communities. Triggers, if something is mm -hmm. top of mind, it's tip of tongue. The book came out uh, around cold and flu season, lots of people sneezing, lots of people reaching for tissues. Uh, so we created some orange tissues that I give out at events that says, don't you wish your idea was this contagious? Mm -hmm. Right, so people then, when they think about sneezing, they think about tissues, they think about, well, not only disease is spreading, but ideas spreading. Mm -hmm. Well, there's that book. I remember that someone told me about that help mm -hmm. uh, think about how ideas can spread. And so each of these principles is important, not just for content, well, what, what am I gonna write on my recent post or my blog, um, but also designing the products themselves, mm -hmm. baking them into the way we build those products to make them more likely to be shared. What makes somebody want to remember or to have almost a photographic memory from an instance like that? I remember reading about you put black toilet paper <laughs> and installed in your house at a party. Yeah. And it's all everybody could talk about yeah. at the party. Yeah. Which I would I would imagine that would be 
something I would talk about. Yeah. What makes somebody really remember that? What's the photographic memory of an idea yeah. that makes it stick? So uh, what makes things stick, what makes things spread, some of them are similar and some are different. Uh, so let's take remarkability, for example. Something really remarkable, uh, like black toilet paper. Not only is someone going to remember that, it's very different from the other things I've seen, but I'm also going to share it. Right? It makes me look cool and smart in the know to realize that there's black toilet paper and I was at some party and some guy had it in the bathroom. <laughs> uh, so both, both sticking and spreading. Uh, but some emotions lead to sticking but not spreading. So sadness, for example. We remember things that make us sad. That sticks in our memory, but we actually don't share things that make us sad. Um, we're less likely to share things that make us sad because sadness deactivates us rather than activates us. Uh, and so there's some things that lead to sticking and some things that lead to sharing, and sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. There's another area that I really am interested in, and I think it's something that everyone in the studio is probably familiar with called yeah. exaggeration. Yes. You cover this in your book as well, and I'm just love to hear your thoughts on exaggeration and yeah. how that plays into storytelling. Yes. And how ideas then get shared out. Yeah. And it's interesting to think about how exaggeration changes online and offline, right? So offline transmission is a little bit like a game of telephone, where one person tells someone something, and they tell someone else, and they tell someone else. And it's not like people perfectly pull out an exact replicate of what the person says and just pass it on like a photocopy. They reconstruct what that person said. Memory is reconstructive. So if you tell me a story, I'll remember some of those details, but I won't remember all of them. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be talking to someone else, and I don't want to look like I have nothing to say, so i got to fill in those details I don't remember. Um, and so a lot of times that leads to exaggeration. So, oh, yeah, I was talking to my friend, and they were I had this interview, and but I don't remember exactly what happened in the interview, so I exaggerate it to make it a better story. If I'm gonna retell it, I might as well tell it to be good rather than, than not so good. Mm -hmm. Now that changes online a little bit, mm -hmm. because online, often people are sharing not just something they remember, they're actually cutting and pasting something, or they're putting a link in an email. And so the content is less likely to get mutated mm -hmm. as it sp spreads from person to person. And mm -hmm. so I think that cuts down a little bit on exaggeration to mm -hmm. some degree. Mm -hmm. Though again, most word of mouth is still offline, so I don't, I don't think mm -hmm. that's going to change much. 7%? Yeah. That's not as big as I would think. Yes. I, was, I would have thought 50%. Yeah. How is 7% so small? I mean, how is that so small on social media for yeah. word of mouth? That, that just... It, where, where do you come up with that number? So I think there are a couple reasons we think that. And uh, first, where we get the number from, uh, there's a company called Keller Fay Group, which is the Nielsen of word of mouth. Uh, they do a bunch of diary studies and other ways of getting word of mouth across the day. So they look at thousands of Americans every week and see what those people talk about and what channel they talk through. Uh, and their work shows that about 7% of word of mouth is online. But I think what's more interesting is why we think that number can't be right. Uh, so if you think about it, there are lots of newspaper articles about Facebook, about Twitter, about Instagram, about Foursquare, you know, whatever that new technology is, it's going to be Vine now, um, because people are always looking for the magic bullet. Marketers are always looking for the shiny new toy, and if I just do this one thing, that's it. My business will be golden. Uh, and often you see a business that's successful, and they're doing something, so you assume, well, if I imitate that thing, I'll be successful. Mm -hmm. Well, my competitors are using Vine. Well, the kids are on Twitter, so we have to get there also. Uh, but that doesn't mean it made them successful. And there are no written articles about offline word of mouth because it's not new. It's not like, uh, you know, offline word of mouth has been going on for thousands of years. It's one caveman sort of nudging another saying, don't eat that, it's poisonous, right? That's the original, face-to-face -face is the original social media. Um, so it's clear why we think so much is online and we have a written record of it, right? We tweet, we post something, we can see it. Whereas online sort of disappears. But it's not, I'm not saying that online isn't important. I'm saying that offline is much more important than we might think. Mm. Yes, a bunch of stuff happens online, but even think, you know, so by some estimates, people spend two and a half hours on their computer. Average American spends two and a half hours on their computer every day. Call it three, call it even four, right? Well, then we spend nine, eight, however many hours you want sleeping. And my math isn't perfect there, but unless I'm missing something, there's still at least 10 hours for offline things to happen. Mm. Offline is still three or four more times amount of time more than online. And so it's not surprising that we do a lot of talking and sharing during that time. There's no written record of it. But um, if you're interested, just keep a diary of what you talk about throughout the day. You'll be amazed at how many things. I mean, we were waiting for the show to start talking about a bunch of different things, which may influence our later behavior, even though we didn't realize it necessarily during the conversation. You know, that's interesting because that's one of the things you said in your, in your book was to look at yourself as a fly on the wall in any conversation that you're having yeah. and see it from the outside perspective and see yeah. what it is that you actually cover. I actually did that today at lunch. I started <laughs> to pay attention to what we were talking about. And yeah. I, I think we covered at least seven or eight brands during the course, at, on some level, yes. during the course of the conversation. Yeah. And that was just astounding to me. I'd never taken that exercise before. I think, I mean, the simplest example, many people got, companies go out to lunch. 
Where do people go out to lunch? Where should we go out for dinner? Uh, there are dozens, if not more than dozens, of restaurants that you could go to. Um, many of them are very good. So you're not picking based on which one is good and which one is not good. You're picking based on which one do I think of when we're talking about where to go to lunch. Uh, and those conversations you had earlier in the day or the day before, someone said, oh, I went here. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, that's not interesting, that's not remarkable, but the fact they talked about it makes it more top of mind for you, which makes it more likely you're gonna go. And so often these subtle things happen without our awareness. So let's talk about secrets. Yeah. And how secrets can actually parlay into something that takes off. Yeah. You talk about that as well. And that's really intriguing because you look at companies like Apple or companies like what you were talking about with the hot dog stand in New York. Yeah. The two are very secretive. Yes. You, you have to get in through a telephone booth, I believe, yes. to get back into a place where you can have drinks. And Yes. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, for those of you out there, it's called Please Don't Tell. It's a bar hidden inside a hot dog restaurant. If you haven't heard about it, I strongly suggest checking it out next time you're in New York. Nice. So how do they build a, the proper secret? Yeah. How does that, because you can tell if it's fake or if it's real. I know that, you know, there's that whole, not to be cliche, authentic uh, yes. perspective. How do you become that? A couple things are important. Uh, first of all, that you are authentic. Um, and second of all, that you deliver on expectations. Um, so you can't create a secret around nothing. Uh, you can, sorry, I should, I, I'm gonna take that back. Right after I said that, <laughs> that is not what I wanna say. Um, I think you can create a secret on many things, whether it be an effective secret or not is an interesting question. Um, you look at In-N-Out, for example. Not the most exciting brand in the world, but a California staple. They have a secret menu. You go there, people can order the Flying Dutchman or the two by two or whatever it is, and people love to do that because it makes them look like a VIP. Mm -hmm. Even though that menu's online. If you go to their website, their secret menu is up on their website. Is that secret? It's actually sort of secret, but it's not that secret. But because it feels secret, it makes people feel special. Same thing with the hot dog restaurant, right? It's not actually a deep secret. You don't have to know somebody really famous to get in or have a lot of money. You just have to know that the place exists. But most people don't know that it exists. And so it has that special feel that makes me feel like I'm an insider. And so that's, that's pure social currency. It makes us look smart and in the know, like we have something that not everyone else does. Um, but it's really important to deliver on expectations. So um, I was talking to some folks at, at General Mills earlier in the week about how to apply these sort of concepts. Um, and you can't do this for anything if you don't deliver. Right? So they were talking about a concert that they're having for their Nature Valley Granola Bar. It's going to be a neat concert. They were saying, what if we keep the lead act a secret until with day of, we release the lead act? Who's the lead act? Well, it's a guy that not that many people have heard of. Some people have heard of him. In the certain community, he's pretty famous, but he's not widely famous. Now, if people think it's a secret, they're going to be really riled up about, oh my God, who it's going to be? Oh, is it going to be David Gray? Is it going to be Coldplay? Is it going to be mm -hmm. U2? I don't know. You know. And then it shows up, and it's this guy that they don't know. They may be a little disappointed. Um, there's a great bar in Philly called Hop Sing Laundromat which tries the secret thing very, they, they, uh, there's no sign on the street, it looks like someone's apartment, you have to ring a special bell, you have to be dressed a certain way. Uh, but then when I went, there were like five people there. Mm. It was pretty empty. Um, and let me tell you, it didn't feel like the payoff was equated with the secret up front. And so mm. I think as long as the payoff is equal, right? In and out, there's not a huge payoff, you're just ordering something that's off the menu but you feel special, you didn't have to do a lot to get it, but the more you make me do to get that secret thing, the more you make me wait, the more you make me put through a bunch of effort, mm -hmm the better the payoff has to be. That was a great example as well. I can quote your book all day long, by the way, about the $100 cheesesteak. $100 cheesesteak, yes. You're, you're, he was trying to figure out how do you take a normal cheesesteak and make that into something unique and special. Yeah. And then I was reading the ingredients that you actually wrote in the book. I was looking around the room for a cheesesteak. I, so, I was so hungry. <laughs> it was lobster and all this great stuff. Yeah. So pricing plays a huge role in changing the value of what it is. Yeah. And so is pricing what makes something, or helps to add to something that actually goes viral? I mean, so uh, the $100 cheesesteak is a neat idea. Um, and uh, you know, it uh, is great because it takes what is, and it's an expensive steakhouse, so it's not just a marketing gimmick. It fits with their brand image. They're a high-end steakhouse, they do high-end things. They wanted to show that they're not a traditional Ruth Chris type of steakhouse. They're really a cutting edge, interesting menu steakhouse. What better for Philly mm -hmm. than a $100 cheesesteak? Uh, and you've seen similar things. So I was at a hotel in New York that had a $1,000 omelet, or you know, people have talked about the $10,000 app that does nothing. Um, at a certain point, some of these things feel a little gimmicky, so you don't want to go over the top. But what I, what I think is the best about the $100 cheesesteak is that it's very triggered by Philadelphia. So if you're in Philly, it's a really good fit. People talk about cheesesteaks all the time in Philly. There are cheesesteak places on this corner and that corner, and your relatives come into town and they want to know which is better, where should I go? Um, 
Cheesesteaks are top of mind a lot. People are talking about them. They need some way to have that conversation, right? We're sitting here talking. If we sit here and I, you ask me a question, I sit here in silence, really awkward, right? And so most of us want to fill that conversational space. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about cheesesteaks. Oh yeah, I remember that $100 cheesesteak. Let me drop that in the conversation. And so it's really important to think about not only is it interesting, but will it be triggered mm -hmm. by the environment, right? Will this idea, this product, this message be something that comes up? That, uh, I like to think about it as, uh, so if I said peanut butter and, most people would say, well, jelly, right? And so peanut butter and jelly, they go together. If X, then Y. If we think about peanut butter, then we think about jelly. Peanut butter is almost like a little advertisement for mm -hmm. jelly. Jelly should pay peanut butter a kickback every time peanut butter is out there. Mm -hmm. um, so think about, well, what's your peanut butter? Right? What's the thing that's going to make people think about you often? Mm -hmm. uh, whether that story is remarkable or not, making sure they bring it up is really important. So speaking of triggers, yeah. what triggers you? It's been interesting going through this process of writing a book. Um, I think that academics are usually very good at their research, but they don't always make sure that research gets out there. Um, and it's been really exciting for me to help take all these great insights from behavioral science and help diffuse them to the broader community. Um, people love viral videos. They love sharing them. They love watching them. Um, every business realizes that word of mouth is important. Whether you're small or large, word of mouth is vital for getting the ideas out there. Um, but until this book, there wasn't a lot of science about that word of mouth. And so now it's been really exciting to share the science with the world, both through the books, uh, through speaking, through workshops. I've gotten a chance to meet with all sorts of companies, uh, large, small, for-profit, non-profit, and really help them apply these ideas. And th there are some amazing and interesting challenges. So I worked with a company recently that does a home HIV testing kit. Um, not something that people really want to talk about. Hey, I got tested for HIV. Let me tell you about it. No one's going to talk about that. Um, or I did some work with Eli Lilly, um, who were thinking about some of their drugs that people have or things that, cases that people might not feel comfortable mm -hmm. talking about. But there are ways to get word of mouth even about those sorts of things. Remember Cialis came out and everyone was talking about the four hour erection. And that was the thing even Cialis didn't try to get people to talk about, but they were talking about it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so everything is talked about. Whatever product or idea you're working on, there's some set of people that are talking about this. Mm -hmm. And so it's been exciting to think about how can we turn those customers into advocates and use the science to help businesses grow. Wow, that's great. Now, what's next on your agenda? Where do you see your brand going? Uh, so we're always doing research, mm -hmm. always new projects, always pushing the envelope forward. We've done some recent work on uh, talking online versus offline and how merely the channel you communicate through shapes what you share. Uh, or talking to one person versus a large group mm -hmm. and how broadcasting versus narrow casting changes what we share. Uh, also doing a lot of consulting uh, and advisory board work and helping companies think about applying these ideas. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, you see some companies are saying, well I know word of mouth, General Mills is a great example. They know they want word of mouth you know, in their, in their monthly meetings, they're showing viral videos and thinking about and unpacking those concepts. And you see other companies are saying, wow, word of mouth, we're really an advertising-based company. We've mm -hmm. never thought about word of mouth. I agree with you, but how do I get the higher ups to realize mm -hmm. how important that word of mouth is? Um, and I think in the tech space, people are all about word of mouth. They recognize that works, but in a lot of traditional businesses, people haven't realized it yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been interesting to help people, depending on where they are in that journey, bring them along the way, show them what we've learned, and, and help them apply the concepts. And thank you again for sitting here and talking with me today and spending your time on Substance. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Cheers.